Good morning. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk to you about HTML email, something I know that you all love doing. Um, so a quick show of hands, who's like, worked on an HTML email at some point? Or something? Okay, so that's, that's like most of you. Okay. And who enjoyed that and thought, this is better than building websites? <laughs> okay, there's a couple of us. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try and sort of, yeah, t talk the rest of you around and tell you how great email is. Um, so yeah, I'm Mark Robbins, that's me. Um, work for Rebel, used to be Rebel Mail, it fits better on a t-shirt now. Um, we build tools for building emails. So I spend all my time writing code for emails. I don't work on websites, haven't professionally touched a website for probably three years now, I think. Um, so it's all, all email built, uh, based stuff all the time. Um, so yeah, as I go along, uh, feel free to tweet along m underscore j underscore robbins and at go rebel mail. Um, send me some questions as well. I'll try and get back to all of them. And if we've got time, maybe get some questions at the end. If not, I'll be outside and in the pub later as well. So um, I've talked to a lot of web developers about uh, email. And there tends to be you know, this same point keep up coming back, that it's complicated. You know, it, it's, which is strange, because it's often a task given to sort of the more junior developers or sort of interns. It's, oh, we'll just give them email until they learn how to do the proper stuff. But it's actually really complicated stuff to work with. Um, it's outdated. You, know, you, can't, it, you can't use any modern web standards, and you can't really do anything cool. There's nothing exciting about email. So I'm going like, to you know, change your minds again. Um, so first of all, like, talk about it being complicated. This is... Um, Chad White, who works for Litmus, and he did a, a blog post recently where he was talking um, about email rendering. He worked out approximately 15,000 potential renderings for your average company when they're sending an email out. So there's quite a lot to consider. Um, the maths he uses here, I added the S. He's American. I had to correct him. Um, this is based on two ESPs. So an ESP is an email service provider. So that's what actually sends the emails, like sort of stuff like MailChimp, SendGrid, Salesforce, all, all that lot. Um, so average company uses two of those, and they can edit the code, they can break the code, and they can change things around, so that affects the rendering. 15 different operating systems, so probably looking at versions there as well. Um, 50 email clients, five different screen sizes, and two image states. So an image state of an email is, when you open an email, it's either got images on or images off, and sometimes and it'll come up and say, would you like to load images? You click a button. That has different rendering, whether their images are on or off. It sort of affects the layout. It, it can actually completely change things around in the case of Gmail, um, where they've got a little bug in there. Um, so that works out as 15,000 different <laughs> renderings. I've done the, um, I've, I'll dispute a couple of those numbers, but it's sort of really sort of nitpicking. Um, and I worked out for, what we send at Revel, and it's yeah, about 70,000, 80,000 different renderings we're looking at. So it's quite complicated. Um, so if we look at a couple of the email clients, first of all, Outlook on Windows, which is known for being a bit of a pain. Um, currently, 7% market share. So that's looking at um, Outlook 2007, uh, 2010, 2013, 2016, and also now um, Windows Live ma Mail, which comes with Windows 10 as sort of a default mail client. And all of those use Microsoft Word as a rendering engine. So they're rendering HTML and CSS with a word processor. And they started doing it in 2007, they're still doing it. I've talked to them about it. They understand it's a pain, but they haven't changed it yet. Um, so because of that, it requires tables for layout. Uh, you can't, because it will accept divs, but it won't accept sort of heights and widths and stuff, so it, it breaks your layout. Um, so you're sort of using like your 90s HTML support. So you've probably heard the term code like it's 1999 for email. And it's, that's because of Outlook. Other email clients are much better than this. This is only 7% market share. Um, there's some confusing CSS support, like some things it, it just works slightly differently to how you'd expect a, a, a normal uh, browser or something that was made to process uh, HTML and CSS to work. So it works slightly different, differently. And they also have these MSO prefixed styles that you can use for Outlook, to, which works slightly differently to normal CSS. But it does support word art. 
which is cool. Um, this is based on VML, which is vector markup language, which is sort of like predates SVG, and it was at one point sort of pitched as a, as a new standard, but then um, SVG came along and was a lot better. Um, so people don't really use that anymore. So if you were to take a normal website and put it into Outlook, it's not going to look very good. So I took the Pixel Pioneers homepage, just clicked View Source, Copy, Paste, and sent it to Outlook. Um, and this is sort of what it came out like. And it's, it doesn't look pretty, but actually the HTML there is rendering. And this is using like sort of your old spec of HTML. And as, as Jeremy was saying, all, all this sort of original stuff, and it, it, it does fall back nicely. It does, you know, it fails well to a certain extent. There are some little issues with it, but you know, you've got your lists, you've got your images, everything seems is still coming through. It's still accessible, which is good. It just doesn't look pretty, and it's a pain to work with. So then if we look at um, a different email client, Apple Mail, again, 7% market share. So Apple Mail comes as default on your Mac. And this is basically Safari. It's tied into Safari, and it's Safari without JavaScript or position fixed. Um, you can sort of fake both of those things a little bit, which I'll show you later. But um, you can use things like animation. You can do CSS animation, SVG animations, uh, transforms, 3D transforms. You can use like, cool things like calc and var and do sort of modern CSS things. CSS grid works in, uh, in Apple Mail. It, because, it was tied, because it's tied to Safari, as soon as Safari was supporting CSS Grid, Apple Mail was supporting CSS Grid. And also, this is 7% market share is looking at desktop. If you bring iOS into that as well, then that's just under 50% of email clients' uh, market share. So that, yeah, that means nearly 50% of emails support CSS Grid. So it's not that outdated. Um, you can also yeah, SVG. Uh, you can do video and audio work as well, just natively as, as it would in Safari. So here I'm going to show you uh, the same website again, Pixel Pioneer's website. Uh, this time I've got a live demo rather than a screenshot. So you can see here, it looks pretty much like it does on the web. Um, you've got a little yeah, email there, just do mark in there. Um, you've got your images, your little hover states are working, and so there's a couple of things missing. There's a little image missing there. A um, little animation on that's working. Also, is responsive, but the hamburger menu's not working. So there's a few things which are not working. This hamburger menu's you know, JavaScript-based, so that's not working. But there's still quite a lot that works as a normal website would. So does email code still suck? And well, I'd argue it's complicated. Yes, it is complicated. But that makes it fun. That makes it interesting. You don't want stuff to be easy and, and sort of, OK, I want to put this there. OK, that's fine. That's just um, arranging things. That's sort of, you know, that's Photoshop. That's not coding. That's not sort of stuff that interests me. I, I like a challenge. It's outdated. Yeah, it's using word rendering. Although you can target that. And that's only 7% of the market share is word rendering. You can use some modern web standards. Uh, there are sort of you know different support across the different email clients as it goes, and can't do anything cool. Well, this brings me on to what I want to talk about, which is interactive email. And this is sort of what I do. This is my specialty, I guess. Um, and it, you can do some really like quite cool stuff in email. So, what is interactive email? Um, first, I'll point out that I am quoting myself, and I really am that pretentious. <laughs> oh. So an action taken in an email that triggers an event within the same email. So what I mean by that is traditionally in email marketing and HTML emails, you send out a message. You send out some text, some images, and a link. And it's like, click here, go to our website, do stuff. With interactive email, we're trying to take that do stuff that you do on the landing page and put it directly into the inbox. So people can interact and people can complete actions and tasks without leaving the inbox, without needing to visit a website. Um, so first of all, I'll explain sort of a bit of the technology behind it. I'm not going to go in too much into code, but it's a little bit for you. Um, so interactions, this is all done with CSS because we don't have JavaScript in email. Well, a couple of them support it, but very badly. Um, so 
uh, interactions uh, with CSS, I break down into two groups of fleeting interactions and sort of more static type of interactions. So the fleeting interactions are hover, focus, and active. So you've probably seen these before, hover, um, focus. So this will only be, this code will be applied as this element is in focus, and active is only when this is being clicked. Uh, interestingly, you can combine hover and focus if you do it that way around as well. It's a nice little trick. Um, so with that, you can get some kind of interaction, although that's not too fun just yet. Um, then the more static interactions uh, is something that's commonly known as a checkbox hack. So this works. You've just got a little checkbox on the side here, which is a normal checkbox that you'll get in a, in a form. And um, then the code is input checked plus code. So if that input is checked, then plus, that's a sibling selector. So it's looking at the next element. And the next element is this code block. Uh, then it will apply the style to that. So when that's clicked, th then that code applies. And why this is static, because I can just go back a page, forward a page, and that's still there. That, that action is going to be there until I choose, as a user, I choose to click it again to remove it. Same thing works with radio buttons. Um, good thing with radio buttons is they're grouped in an in a array, grouped by the name attributes. So all these three radio buttons have the same name. Uh, so only one of them can be checked at a time. So as soon as I click on one of the radio buttons, then the previous one that was checked loses its checked value. So only one of them at a time. So I'll show you an example of something that um, we've built using this. So this is an email that went out uh, a while ago. Oops. So I'm just trying to make it a bit bigger there. Um, for a popular hotel alternative brands. I don't know how to describe them. Um, so here we've got a gallery, basically. Um, large image, four thumbnail images below it. Um, currently, it's uh, animating through. There's just a bit of CSS animation on there, which is changing the images. Now, when I interact with it, that animation is then paused. Um, and I can take manual control over it and just click on the thumbnails and change the image. So this is essentially four radio buttons, one for each image. When image one is checked, then image one is shown. When the radio button for image three is checked, then that one's shown. Um, which is, so it, it just works and functions like a gallery normally would. Um, and one of the great things about this is, you know, this is new to email. People haven't been doing this in email for long. But the users don't know that. And the users don't notice. The users look at that, and they see a large image, four small images below. They know it's a gallery. They know if they click on a thumbnail, it's going to change the image. And that's one of the great things about it, is that people just use it like, instinctively. In the same way you know that's a gallery, if you look below here, this red box with some white text in it, you know that's a button. You know that's a link through to the website. And it's, all it is is just a box with some text in. But you still know that because of these sort of design conventions that people are used to. Um, oh, one more thing with this as well. Um, I've got a little search bar in the top. Um, so if I was to do, where, where do I want to look for? Uh, let's look at Bristol. And hopefully, oh, hang on, sorry, it's just loading on a different page. <laughs> Should load up if we've got enough internet. Um, anyway, <laughs> form submits work in email. You can do a basic form submit, submit the data through, and then do, do a search for the location like that, although the internet's a little bit iffy at the moment, I'm afraid. So that's pretty cool, but obviously this doesn't work everywhere. You're not going to get that to work in Outlook. Well, I haven't yet, anyway. So, and we've got these 15,000, at least 15,000 different renderings we're looking at to, of how to, you know, so how are we going to deal with those? Um, what we do is we group all these uh, email clients and their different renderings into three buckets of static, limited, and interactive. These vary a bit depending on what you're building. I'm still focusing on the gallery here, but there are other sort of modules and components and stuff we build. Um, but just looking at the gallery still, static, limited, and interactive. So static is something that is what, what most people are sending at the moment. 99.9% like .9 of people are sending at the moment static email. Which, and here I've just represented that with a fallback image of just an image. That takes a 35% market share. Limited um, has some form of limited interactivity, but not all the bells and whistles. 
that's 6%, and then interactive, 54%. Everything that I, I'm going to show you will work in those clients. It's really cool stuff, and it, it's the majority of email clients. Um, these percentages as well, incidentally, they are taken from a website, which is emailclientmarketshare.com, which is put together by Litmus. Um, they have one of their products that they have at Litmus is um, email analytics, and they'll tell you what email client um, the, your email has been opened in. So this is percentage based on opens. Um, and every month, they release the top 10 email clients, which is why it only adds up to 95%. The other 5% aren't in the top 10. But that's based on 1.29 billion opens from last month. So it's a you know, pretty fair number to be looking at. Um, so how we target these um, static is stuff. I've, I've got an MSO conditional comment there, same way I conditional comments work, except this is for MSO, Microsoft Office, so for Outlook. Um, and then anything that sort of breaks the styles, that's going to get your, your static. Those are the ones we, we don't have the full support we want. To get the limited uh, experience, you need the check selector and the sibling selector. And for the interactive, you need the, the general sibling selector, the little tied tilde or wiggly line um, symbol, and just cool WebKit stuff. Um, all the good email clients are based on WebKit, um, or sort of the, the interactive ones, apart from Thunderbird, which is Mozilla. Um, but that will, and Thunderbird sort of sits sometimes in interactive, sometimes in limited, depending on what you're doing with it. Um, and just for, for a user experience point of view, um, there is very subtle differences here. Um, here you've got the limited gallery changing the images, and that works you know, pretty nicely. Interactive, I've got a slight transition going on. So you can just do a little transition between the images, whereas the, gal the <coughs> limited is just a hard jump. And also these uh, arrows on the end, so you can do an infinite scrolling through that. So it's just extra little polish, extra little enhancements between the two. So you can build some quite cool stuff, like with that, with the uh, gallery. You can do hamburger menus just with a checkbox to expand stuff out. You can do little accordions to expand out, read more, and just expand out a bit more content. And that's all quite cool. But I wanted to sort of push things a bit further and see like how far you could take these interactions and how, how much of a sort of non-email non experience could you build in email, stuff that people wouldn't be expecting. Um, so I developed this technique, uh, which I call punch card coding. So punch card coding only works in the interactive, out of those three groups, in the interactive. There's no sort of limited version of this, unfortunately. Um, and the reason it's called punch card coding, as you can see, on the left here, there's a whole load of radio buttons. And on the right is an old IBM punch card. And the visually similar, so that's where the name came from. But also, they work in a very similar way. So the punch cards, the old punch cards, they, you have a piece of card with a number of places where you can put a hole in it. Then you put that into the machine, and the machine will look, and it'll say, is this position punched or not? The same way with the radio buttons. Is this checked or not? Is this true or false? If it's one or zero, and then you put together a string of ones and zeros, you have binary, and you can build loads of cool stuff. So here's a, here's a little sort of you know, last bit of code, I promise, is uh, this long CSS select that I've got here, um, just to show how it all works together. So the way it works, you have all these radio buttons at the very top of your code. They're all they're set to display none, so you don't see them, but they're, they're, they're just functional. And they're all at the very top of the code. And then you have a wrapper around all your, your code, the rest of your code. Um, so every one of those radio buttons is a sibling of that wrapper, because they're all on the same level. So checking any one of those, you can eff effectively change things within the wrapper. And then you can start stringing it together. So here, you have item A3 checked. So I have item A, number of radio buttons in there, number three is checked. That's a sibling of B6 checked. So this has to be in order from first to last because you can't do backward siblings at the moment. B6 checked, C2 checked, D11 checked, E5 is not checked. So you could have any other uh, value of E that's checked, or none of them at all are checked, just as long as 5 isn't checked. And then that, this will be true. F2 checked, G5 checked. That's the sibling of the wrapper. Inside the wrapper, we have a class of foo, and that's set to display none. That's set to display none only when this sort of complex series of radio buttons are checked in that correct, correct way. So 
what can we build with this? Um, I'll just show you another example. This is a, a shopping cart. Uh, it's a concept I built a couple of years ago. Um, it's one of the uh, early concepts we built at Rebel Mail, just sort of to sh show what was possible. So here you've got three products in the in a shopping cart. There's a couple more at the bottom there. Um, so first of all, you look at the quantity. So it's quantity one of this. I can just change that up to five, down to zero. And if zero is there, then it's you know, changed the opacity of it. So this is six radio buttons, zero, one, two, three, four, five. So it's six radio buttons. Depending on which one is checked, it's changing the quantity there. So just restore that. Um, also, as we're changing these quantities, you can see just the total price here, as well as the subtotal, the tax, the discount, and the total price at the bottom are all changing at the same time. So this is all, again, all done with CSS. This is using uh, CSS counters, so CSS counter increments. Um, so for example, with the socks here, I've got the total price at 12. Uh, so the CSS counter increment, if quantity one is checked, is set to 12. Quantity two is checked, it's set to 24. Three is 36, and so on. And then those other counter increments were also being applied to the rest of the subtotal tax, discount, and total price. So you can do all your calculations on the fly purely in CSS, which is pretty cool. Um, another feature in here, um, you're looking at sort of that hoodie in the middle. It's like, oh, that's all right. Although I'm not sure the color of it, and it's size medium, maybe I want to get a bit bigger. Um, so then you have to go back to the website and change it before you can do it in the email. Or what we have done is created a product page within the email. So again, this works in exactly the same way as the gallery and as the counters. You have six pages in this email. When page one, radio button for page one is checked, page one shows. When page two is checked, page two shows. And again, as it's losing the checked value from page one, then that's hidden as well. Um, in here again, just another gallery. Um, I change the color here, sort of red version, and then change the size to large, and we'll go back to the, to the home page. And you can see the thumbnail here has changed, and the, the color name has changed, and the size has changed. So all this is being controlled by the radio buttons in the top, so it doesn't matter what page it's on, because they're all wrapped in the same wrapper code. Um, then, yes, then we want to uh, buy these products. So to, to check out, um, we'll just click buy now. And then we can't because we haven't read it properly. And there's form validation built in. And HTML form validation does work in some email clients, uh, which is really cool. However, it's quite, HTML form validation is pretty cool, but it does have its limitations in the sort of the styling and the message that you're putting out with it. So um, this is all done with CSS. So we can control it a bit more. So here, the shipping address. I've got two shipping addresses there. If n nothing is selected from the shipping address array of radio buttons, we'll show the message. As soon as I select one, then that message disappears. Um, and same with the credit card. Uh, let's put the Amex. Also, these um, drop-down menus, again, are based on radio buttons, because with a select menu, we can't detect what's being selected. So it has to be, we're replicating the same functionality, but just with CSS. Um, and then just confirm to check, uh, to, okay, confirm the payments, check out, and then you click buy now. And then if you were to click buy now, then uh, that form, this whole thing is wrapped in a form, including all the radio buttons. So that'll be sent off to the server. The server will look at the radio buttons and it, it'll decode it, put the orders together, send it out. And you've, you've just bought uh, some things from the email without visiting the website. Apart from when you, click, when you click by now, it'll take you to a page saying thank you for your order. That is the website. Um, so there are some restrictions with this. Um, you've got a file size limited to 102 kilobytes. So that's not looking at sort of image size and stuff. That's just looking at your code file, uh, your, your HTML file that you're sending out. Um, it's 102 kilobytes. If it goes over that, then the email gets clipped in a number of email clients. Uh, so it just sort of cuts the bottom off. Uh, sometimes CSS doesn't render when that happens as well. Um, and also, you get a higher spam score. 
So the big thing with email is deliverability, and if you get high spam score, it doesn't get hit to the inbox, so there's no, no point in sending it. Um, it's not going to definitely, if it goes over that, it's not 100% going to go into the spam. It just increases the score. It's the same sort of way, I guess, that SEO works. Sort of like a number of different factors come together to decide you know, how high your ranking is. This is whether you get the inbox or the spam folder. Um, CSS in Gmail is limited to 16,384 characters. Uh, that's quite, that's, you know, it's quite a lot, but it's not really. Um, if you want to do all this complicated stuff. Um, so if you go over that limit, Gmail will just strip out all the styles. So if you just put one character over, the whole style block is removed. Also with Gmail, um, it's very strict in what you can include. So if you put in any characters it doesn't like, the whole style block is removed. If you put in a media query that they don't support, the whole style block is removed. If you use an attribute selector, whole style block is removed. So you're quite, quite restricted with Gmail. Um, however, um, if you want to start doing, doing all these extra things, extra styles, you just separate out the style blocks. So you put a style block first, which is for Gmail, and then additional style blocks with all your cool advanced stuff. Uh, and Gmail will strip out, it'll read from the top, and it, until the style blocks add up to over that, then it'll just delete any style block which is going over that limit. So it, it is restrictive, and you have, to, you have to be careful about things because you could break your layout by removing some of these styles. Um, ESPs can break the code. So I mentioned this briefly earlier as well. Email service providers, when you upload your code, some of them will add additional code to it, so it might take you over the limit, or maybe just add things which will break your layout or change the width of your email. Um, some of them will just remove things and just, like uh, MailChimp, for example, will strip out any form elements and, and, and any CSS animation. So that will just be stripped out and the rendering will look bad. It will look, look terrible, <laughs> um, which is frustrating. But there are ways around it. MailChimp, for example, if you send through MailChimp, this won't work. If you send through Mandrill, it will, which is sort of the... Um, API version, you just, uh, and most e ESPs have an API version that doesn't edit the code, so you can get around it. Um, you need a device lab for testing, because this is all quite new stuff, there's a lot of, you know, all these different renderings, different environments to test in. It's really tricky to do it without a device lab, so um, I have a small device lab uh, in my office in Brighton, I've got a number of different phones, um, each with a number of email clients installed on them. Um, my, my laptop here has got a load of email clients on it. We've got um, a few emulators and simulators and things we use. Uh, and our New York office has got loads more stuff as well. So you really need hands-on like, sort of testing. Um, and one of the really big, tricky things with email is that email clients have no public beta versions. There's no documentations and no release notes. So when Yahoo was particularly bad for this, I think, last year, they would push, push an update and it would break the rendering because they would start in, enforcing um, you know, various uh, elements. They would be changing height to min height. Um, they're changing, over, if this, then they'll add overflow scroll onto things. So it's breaking a layout. Uh, they had something which was make, forcing everything to align left. So it's quite tricky and they don't tell you about this. So the first you hear about it is when you open up your email and you're testing and you see it breaking. Um, however, the email community is really strong with this, really good. As soon as something like that happens, uh, as soon as the first person sees it, they'll share it. And it's put it on Twitter, put it on, there's a Slack group, um, email um, sort of forums, community forums and stuff. And they share around this information. They, everybody sees the bug, everybody tries to fix the bug. As soon as somebody's fixed it, then that's shared. And then hopefully the next day, all those emails, it's usually within 24 hours, this, the, the bug will be found and fixed. So the next day, every email that goes out should be fixed. But every email that's already been sent is going to be broken, which is really tricky to work with. Um, although one, one thing, um, Gmail did sort of bug this trend in September last year. They started supporting um, media queries in their mobile app, which is nice, because they've been supporting media queries on the desktop uh, for for ages, but they've only just started supporting it on mobile, um, which is crazy. Um, but when they did that, they had a, a private beta version, which I was lucky enough to be part of, 
Um, and they did release documentation on it, and they said, right, this is what we're going to support, and uh, this and only this. And so we, we could test it, and we could work things out before they released it, which is very useful. Um, and ho we're hoping to get more uh, email clients on board with that idea. Um, so I've got a few minutes left. I'm just going to show you some sort of some cool things that I've built. So I mentioned earlier the Apple Mail supports um, 3D CSS. So I decided that I, I wanted to build something, uh, something 3D. Um, so I've got this X-Wing. I didn't actually design, build the X-Wing myself. There's a website called Tridiv, T-R-I-D-I-V.com. Um, and it's like a 3D graphics pa package that exports in CSS. It's really cool. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. So I just took that, and this is one of the examples on there, so I just took that code, put it in an email, sent it, and yeah, and it works. But you don't really know that that's 3D CSS. You look at it, it could be an image. It could be like some cleverly al aligned divs, and it could be flat. But it is 3D. Um, so to prove that it's 3D, I built a wrapper so you can rotate it um, on three axes, so rotating on the x-axis, on the y, and uh, on a z-axis as well. And also there's a little boost in here that it can just shoot off into the distance, <laughs> which is cool. Um, all right, so just reset that. So the way that works, you just put the 3D CSS in the, in the code, and then wrap that with three divs. Each one of those divs is set to, with animation on it, an, animate, nah, animate to transform, rotate, uh, X, rotate Y, and rotate Z. And then those animations are set to animation play state paused. Then at the top here, I've got these buttons, uh, just regular buttons, one for each rotation. So if the button to rotate X is active, then the, then it will rotate, then the play state is set to running. So I'm using the active selector, which is one of the early basic fleeting interactions. Active like, is you know, quite an old uh, bit of CSS. But I'll just show you, sort of, if I add these grids, hopefully you can see, oops, oh, I can't really see my mouse there. Yeah, you might be able to see sort of a grid around that um, to show how it, how it works. Um, so as I rotate the outer element, that's rotating everything. Then if I rotate just one of the inner elements, that's just the outer element is left static. And then again, the middle here. And then with the boost, there's an extra div in there, which just uh, transform on the Z, just to move it, move it away. So, um, so that got me thinking. If I can build 3D, in email, can I build Wolfenstein 3D in email? So you see how the natural thought process works there. Um, so I thought I'd give it a go. Um, so for those of you who are too young to remember, Wolfenstein 3 is the first ever first-person shooting up game. It sort of predates Doom. It was really cool. It was the best game ever made. So here, same idea, we've got the controls at the top here, can walk forward and back, move, move left and right. It's a little bit buggy, um, it's an email. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this, the concept's the same, whereas with the, uh, the X-Wing, I had the code in front there which was rotating around. Here that rotation is just moved around the screen. So it's almost like if I was to put a box over my head and move it forwards, it looks like I'm walking forward, but actually I'm just staying still and moving a box in my head. So we can just walk, walk through this corridor. Um, oh, oh, hello. Why is that not working? <laughs> um, this did work before. <laughs> Sorry, let me just try this again. So I'd walk down there and turn the corner. Ah, yes, there we go. <laughs> so I turn the corner there, and there's a little baddie there shooting at me. Um, so I just shoot him back. He's just a checkbox. <laughs> <laughs> 
if the checkbox isn't checked, there's an animation of him shooting. Once it's checked, that changes to an animation of him dying. However, it's not a checkbox, it's a radio button, because when it's a checkbox, if I check it, I click him again, he's going to come back to life. And it's not that kind of game. Um, so then if we just walk, walk down the end here, then one more baddie. I slightly redesigned the graphics uh, from the original. And then, oh, damn it. This happens sometimes. Yeah, um, he, he should be dying, but he's not. <laughs> That's not a sort of a comment on society. That's just, he's not working. Uh, like I say, it's, it's an email. Uh, <laughs> so he's pushing things a bit far. But um, yeah, that does normally work. Um, both those examples are on my code pen if you want to have a look at the code and play around with it. So it's just code pen, whatever, m underscore j underscore robbins. Um, and then one final example, um, which is this one itself, um, is that the presentation is in an email. And uh, so everything I've showed you today has been from Apple Mail. Uh, so if I just click here, we can see all the radio buttons controlling this. Um, I can move back to the first slide, jump around, whichever order you want. Um, slides in. Um, also, I mentioned uh, CSS grid works in, um, in email. So I thought I'd do a grid layout as well of all the slides. So you can see, and even from this grid layout, you can still you know, interact with it and see the things moving around and change the, these images. And... Uh, well, where's my grid? How do I get the grid off? <laughs> oh, there it is. No, this works. I built it. Thank you very much. Thank you.